Well, hello to all you online. Welcome and in joining us here. We're excited about our lesson today. So, as has been mentioned a couple of times already, one of the focus of our lesson today is there is no one like our God. There is none other. There is no God besides our God. And as we work through our lesson today, we'll see many examples of why there's no one like our God and in what ways he's different from others. And one of them is that he predicts the future. And the reason he can predict the future is because he is the one that determines what the future is going to be. And whatever he determines and whatever he purposes will happen. And, and no one else can do that. And we're going to see some prophecy in our lesson today that was fulfilled and some that will be in the future and will be part of that as we've talked many times about the millennial kingdom. But only uh, the one true God, the only God there is, can predict the future. Speaking of predicting, how do you predict you'll do on today's quiz? Well, let's find out. Get ready for your quiz, one, two, three, B. I think that's the favorite part, Barbara, of their morning is the popular quiz. Yours is a close second, but that popular quiz rates right up there. All right, so number one. What's the name of the king who will conquer Babylon and allow the Jewish exiles to return to their land? What's the name of the king who will conquer Babylon and allow the Jewish exiles to return to their land? And you actually get extra points, probably added on to your mansion in heaven, if you can tell what country he's from. <laughs> I, I don't have total authority on that extra mansion thing, but um, anyway, if you, can, if you know what country that king is from. All right, number two, there were two Babylonian gods mentioned in your lesson today. Can you, do you know the name of even one of them, those, those Babylonian gods that were mentioned in our lesson today? You may not be leafing through your lesson at this time <laughs> to try and find those. <laughs> two Babylonian gods mentioned. All right, number three. What is the name of the prophet taken by Nebuchadnezzar, who many years later predicted the Medo-Persians would conquer Babylon? And he was also alive when that actually happened. Who was that prophet taken by Nebuchadnezzar, who many years later would predict the Medo-Persians would conquer Babylon? And he was alive when it happened. If you're thinking, what are you talking about? It was in your homework. <laughs> All right, and letter, uh, our bonus question. What year did the exiles return back to their land? What year did they return back? We've been talking a lot about the year that Jerusalem fell, so it's not that year, it's the year they came back. I gave you a little warning last week that you might want to know that date. All right, let's go through our answers then. So, what's the name of the king who will conquer Babylon and allow the Jewish exiles to return to their land? Cyrus. Cyrus, and, and where, uh, what king is he? He's the king of Persia. Persia. All right. Actually, Barbara went over that a little bit in, during the timeline, and if you were listening, that gave you some clues too. Okay, who are the two Babylonian gods mentioned in your lesson? Who's the first one? Bel, Bel and Nebo. Nebo. Bel and Nebo are the two Babylonian gods. Uh, number three, the name of the prophet taken by Nebuchadnezzar, who many years later predicted that the Medo-Persians would conquer Babylon, and he was alive when it happened. Who was that? Daniel. Daniel, very good, Daniel. And what year did the exiles start returning to their land? Again, they came in different waves and different times. When did they start returning? Five thirty six BC. Five thirty six BC. And when they came back they started rebuilding the temple. Okay, so that's when the temple under Zerubbabel <laughs> uh, they started started rebuilding. Seventy years after. That's perfect. Okay. So as you know, we are on part two of Isaiah. And in part one, we learned a lot about Judah and the city of Jerusalem and their sin and their rebellion and judgment. We also learned that there would be a remnant that would be come to Christ, and we know that will happen during and at the end of the tribulation. 
We're in part two now, and we've seen uh, a lot of talk about the contrast between God and idols. And this week we'll see that again. The contrast between God and who he is and what he can do versus idols uh, who can do nothing because they're a chunk of wood. And uh, they uh, can, cannot help, they cannot deliver, and they certainly cannot predict the future. And then today we're going to be talking about Cyrus, who has been alluded to, but today in our lesson he is named. Cyrus, who at the point we're in, he's, he uh, will be the future king of Persia, um, and he's named 150 years before he was uh, even born. Well, last week we did talk a little bit about the purpose of our lives, that we are to represent Christ well. And, you know, that's simple enough to understand the fact that, okay, that is my purpose, to represent Christ well. Well, then what does that look like? And I just want to mention a couple of things. Jesus said the two most important commandments are to love God and love others. So I can say, how's your love life? Are you loving God and are you loving others? And then, therefore, the greatest sins would be not loving God and not loving others. We like to point at people and how awful their sins are, and we would never do that, and they are terrible, but the worst sins are not loving God and not loving others. And then, to get just a short biography of Jesus and what it would look like to represent Christ well, would be... Uh, Galatians 5, where it gives the list of the fruit of the Spirit. So if you are wondering if you are representing Christ well, go over that list of the fruit of the Spirit. Are those evident in my life? Do people see those things? And do they see me growing more and more in love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control? (laughs) Self-control, that's a big one. Uh, Not a lot of that... um, seen in our country or culture. All right, let's take uh, some of our maps and charts and get those ready so that we um, have a good idea of what we're going to be talking about today. Let's start with the timeline, which in your notes is page 197. 197 on the timeline. We've looked at this before, but again, every few weeks I want to look at it again. You have a timeline. And we have at the top the kings of Babylon. We mentioned in our quiz uh, Nebuchadnezzar. You can see when he reigned, and he was the one that came and attacked Jerusalem. And he took those three different waves of uh, cap, 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 took people into captivity. Daniel was in the first one, Ezekiel in the second one, and then the third time uh, took most of the people back. Um, that was King Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. And then you see under all that, you see the 70-year Jewish captivity. Um, and then after that, you see the return of the remnant to Israel. Oh, and there's our date, 536. That was in our quiz today. And then if you want to put after that, after return of the remnant, you know, it's just blank. There's nothing there. It's kind of the border. But if you want to put Nehemiah, uh, 445 B.C., So that'd just be kind of in the margin there. Nehemiah, 445 B.C., that's when Nehemiah came to build the walls. So there was the temple going up and the city going up, and then Nehemiah came in 445 and and, uh, led the project in rebuilding the walls. And uh, that would have been under Artaxerxes. If you want to go up to kings of Medo-Persia, Artaxerxes isn't on there because their timeline doesn't go that far. But Artaxerxes, if you want to put in the margin there. We see after Nebuchadnezzar, And then his son, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, and then Belshazzar is his grandson, is the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. There you see Cyrus, because that was the end of the Babylonian Empire, and then the Medo-Persians came in, and we see Cyrus there. We're going to be talking about Cyrus today. And the fall of Babylon, you see, is 539. Um, And then the decree to allow the exiles to go back. And I want you to notice at the bottom we've got Jeremiah as a prophet, uh, and Jeremiah was alive when uh, Nebuchadnezzar came in and destroyed Jerusalem. He was alive during that. And you will see that his time overlaps with Daniel and Ezekiel. And that's important because they would have been under Jeremiah's prophecy and teaching. So when they were carried off and taken to Babylon, they could have encouraged and did encourage the other people because they remembered Jeremiah's prophecies. And especially Daniel remembered that the captivity was to be 70 years. And he began praying about that, that the 70 years uh, were over. And it was um, 
imploring God to to act and to allow the exiles to go home. So that's important. All right, let's look at the map. Your map is on 193, the uh, the map that goes with Isaiah part two. And again, just to get uh, this, the visual in our mind here of where we're talking about. So, of course, we have Jerusalem there by the Mediterranean Sea, and then straight east of that is Babylon, and we know the Babylonians came in those three waves, but particularly 586 B.C. and conquered and brought them back into the, um, to Chaldea, Bab- Babylon, that area there. And then if you go farther east, you see Medea and Persia, and that is where Cyrus was, because Cyrus first conquered Medea, and then he moved into all the uh, surrounding areas and became a world empire there, but he came to Babylon. And from Babylon, he then allowed not just the, the Jewish exiles to go home, but all the exiles uh, were allowed to return to their lands. And not all the Jewish exiles went home. Uh, 70 years is a long time, and a lot of them were born there in Babylon, and they just stayed um, and did not all go back, but m- many of them did. So you can see Babylon, and then they, the exiles would have gone back to Jerusalem. Uh, so that's helpful to get an idea of what we're talking about. And then if you'll take your Isaiah at a glance, and that is page 190, and we're filling in our chapter uh, title, Themes. So 190. Um, we're finishing up chapter 44 today. That was Blessings for Israel and God versus Idols. That was last week, but we're finishing it up. Uh, this week we're, we'll be studying chapter 45, God uses King Cyrus, God uses King Cyrus. And then 46 is again about idols, but it's Babylon's idols, so Babylon's idols, not just the idols that the Jewish people had, but Babylon's idols versus the true God. All right, well, as I said, we are going to be finishing up chapter 44 this week. And I want to actually start <clears throat> with reading from, and if you have your Bible, if you brought your Bible to Bible study, and I, I know that usually we use our observation worksheets, and we will, but I want to start with Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles comes right before Ezra. But it's easier to find Second Chronicles than it is to find Ezra. The very last verses, actually, of 2 Chronicles. So 2 Chronicles 36. 2 Chronicles 36. I'm going to start reading with verse 11. 2 Chronicles 36, 11. Okay, follow along as I read 11 through um, the end of the chapter. So Zedekiah, now if you remember from our king's chart, Zedekiah was the very last king of Judah before uh, the southern kingdom was destroyed. Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. He did evil, mostly mostly bad kings. He did evil in the sight of the Lord his God. He did not humble himself before Jeremiah the prophet who spoke for the Lord. So again, Jeremiah was a prophet in those last days. Jeremiah predicted and then lived through the fall of Jerusalem. Uh, Verse 13, he also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar, that would be the king of Babylon, who had made him swear allegiance by God. But he, Zedekiah, stiffened his neck and hardened his heart against turning to the Lord God of Israel. Very sad verse there. Furthermore, all the officials of the priest and the people were very unfaithful, following all the abominations of the nations, and they defiled the house of the Lord which he had sanctified in Jerusalem. The Lord, the God of their fathers, sent word to them again and again by his messengers. We've been studying that, haven't we, that over and over and over for many years, the prophets warned. He sent a word to them. Why? Look at that. Because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place, which was Zion, Jerusalem, the temple. But they, the people, and specifically it talked here about the priests, they continually mocked the messengers of God, despised his words, and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people, until there was no remedy. Meaning God said, enough, you've been warned and warned. Now, um, because I am a just, holy God, it is time for judgment. 
Verse 17, therefore he, God, brought up against them the king of the Chaldeans. Remember, Chaldeans, Babylonian, same thing. So that would have been Nebuchadnezzar. Who slew their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary and had no compassion on young man or virgin, old man or infirm. He gave them all into his hand. The Lord gave everyone into Nebuchadnezzar's hand. Verse 18, all the articles of the house of God, great and small, and the treasures of the house of the Lord, and the treasures of the king and all his officers, he brought them all to Babylon. So all, all the things that belonged to the temple and to the Lord were all taken off to Babylon. Then they, the Babylonians, burned the house of God and broke down the wall of Jerusalem and burned all its fortified buildings with fire and destroyed all its valuable articles. We talked last week about part of the judgment was going to be this fire that the people still would not learn from. And here's the verse that talks about Jerusalem being burnt. Those who had escaped from the sword, he, so the king of Babylon, carried away to Babylon, and they were servants to him and to his sons until the rule of the kingdom of Persia. And we know that that's going to be Cyrus who's going to come in and take over Babylon. And the reason that's done is 21, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed its Sabbaths. All the days of its desolation, it kept Sabbath until 70 years were complete. What is that about? Well, in the law, God required that the Jews let their land rest. Every seven years, they had to give their land a rest for a year, and they weren't allowed to, to harvest it, to, to plant it. To, it had to rest. They were not allowed to try to grow crops. Well, they didn't do that. They just went ahead and kept planting, and they uh, did not keep that law for 490 years. They did not rest their land. So part of their captivity, of course we know it was because they rebelled against God's laws and ways. Well, part of his laws and ways was that they, they let this land rest and they didn't. So they went into captivity and guess what? The land rested. The land got its rest. It caught up with that Sabbath rest that the land was supposed to have for 70 years. And we know that again, that first deportation was in 605 BC and then they did not return until 536 BC. And part of that was to fulfill that Sabbath rest that the land needed. Verse 22, now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he sent a proclamation throughout his kingdom and also put it in writing saying, thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. The house would be the temple. Whoever there is among you of all his people, he's talking to all these captives, may the Lord his God be with him and let him go up. So let him go up, up to Jerusalem. Jerusalem's always up because it's uh, elevated. Now turn the page and let's go into Ezra, the very next book, Ezra 1. And the first few verses are almost identical to what we just read. So I'm going to start on verse 4. So Ezra 1, 4. This is Cyrus talking. Every survivor at whatever place he may live, let the men of that place support him with silver and gold, with goods and cattle, together with a free will offering for the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. And so this is Cyrus letting the people go and sending them off with support. Uh, to, to help in the rebuilding. Let's keep reading. Verse 5. Then the heads of fathers' households of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites arose, even everyone whose spirit God had stirred up to go and rebuild the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. Remember, house of the Lord means the temple. All those about them encouraged them with articles of silver, with gold, with good, and cattle, and valuables, aside from all that was given as a freewill offering. Also, King Cyrus brought out the articles, this is so important, <clears throat> brought out the articles of the house of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had carried away from Jerusalem and put in the house of his gods. And I do, we just read about that and how Nebuchadnezzar took all that. Now it's coming back to Jerusalem. And Cyrus, king of Persia, had them brought out by the hand of Mithridath, the treasure, and he counted them out to Shezbazar, the prince of Judah. Now this was their number, 30 gold dishes, 1,000 silver dishes, 29 duplicates, 
30 gold balls, 410 silver balls of a second kind, and a thousand other articles. All the articles of gold and silver numbered 5,400. Sheshbazar brought them all up with the exiles who went up from Babylon to Jerusalem. So, so exciting to see that though they were carried away, they are now being brought back. Okay, so that kind of helps set the tone and the, some history and background for uh, what we're going to be studying uh, today. So we are in Isaiah 44, verse 24. Uh, last week I gave you a sheet that had just that passage on it. If you don't have it, that's okay. Just Isaiah 44, starting with verse 24. And as we read this, starting out, I want you to note all the verbs of what God does. We're going to see all these things that God does. But also the very first phrase is that phrase I keep telling you to, um, to notice. And here it is. Thus says the Lord. A very powerful, important phrase. That's the first thing in verse 24. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the one who formed you from the womb, I, the Lord, am the maker of all things. So we see some verbs already. The Lord formed the whole nation, and the Lord is the maker of all things. Over and over and over in the Bible, God emphasizes the fact that he is the creator, and he is sovereign, and because he created everything, he has the right to rule. He's the maker of all things. And here's something else, stretching out the heavens by myself. He stretched out the heavens. He created the universe and spreading out the earth all alone. So he created the universe, he created the earth, and he did this all alone out of nothing by himself, God. Now we have a triune God, and we learn in the New Testament that Jesus created everything, but Jesus is God, uh, but it is God who created. Uh, verse 25 there. Some other things he did, notice these verses that God does, causing the omens of boasters to fail. So of these boasters, we're going to see diviners, and we're going to see um, wise men, meaning they're wise in their own eyes. We're going to see that these are false prophets. So he causes the omens of the boasters to fail. Omens, they're, uh, again, mess, uh, involved in the occult and trying to predict future from omens and using the occult. And then making fools out of uh, diviners, which would be, again, the occult, uh, causing wise men to draw back, those that are wise in their own eyes, and turning their knowledge, and this would be supposed knowledge, they think they're wise, it's their human wisdom, turning it into foolishness. So we see here God causes and makes and turns, so some other things that he does here. Then he's got another list, but this would be a different list of what he does. This is dealing with his true prophets, in verse 26, confirming the word of his servant and performing the purpose of his messengers. So here servant and messengers are parallel terms. It's talking about the true prophets. It's talking about Isaiah and Jeremiah and other true prophets, that God confirms their word, and he performs the purpose that he has for them. He does he gives them prophecy, which they announce and write, and then he, uh, he causes it to happen. And God continues to speak. He says, it is I who says of Jerusalem, she shall be inhabited. And of the cities of Judah, they shall be built. And I will raise up her ruins again. Now remember, Isaiah is receiving this information from the Lord, and he's telling this to the people, and he lived right around 700 B.C. And part of your homework was a list of what conditions were like at that time. Um, I'll read it to you. It's actually on page uh, 28 of your homework. So Isaiah is saying, hey, Jerusalem will be inhabited, and it'll be built, and it'll rise up from the ruins. And the people were looking at what, what were fine. We're good, because at that time, uh, Babylon had not invaded. Uh, Jerusalem was um, inhabited and intact. It wasn't, it, what's the problem about it being built? It, it is built, it, it's, it's gorgeous, it's wonderful. The temple was standing strong and beautiful. And uh, the Cyrus guy that he's gonna talk about, who is Cyrus and why should we be afraid of the Babylonians? Remember at that time it was Assyria that uh, was powerful and the bad guy and Babylonian was, was not a threat. So what is this Isaiah talking about? He must be getting senile, you know, because what, what is with us? So 
Um, we see here that Jerusalem will be inhabited and built. So this is talking about the restoration that will happen under Cyrus, but it is also a foreshadowing of what will happen during the millennial kingdom and also the eternal kingdom. We know that uh, during the tribulation, most of the earth will be um, ravaged and destroyed. Um, and then there will be, but God will come and he will live in Jerusalem. And then after the millennial kingdom, there will be a new heaven and a new earth, including a new Jerusalem, which is described for us in the book of Revelation that new Jerusalem will come down from heaven and there'll be a new Jerusalem. So this foreshadows that also. And then God reminds them of some things that he has done in the past. In verse 27, it is I who says to the depth of the sea, be dried up. Of course, that's speaking about the Red Sea when the Israelites uh, crossed over on dry ground, fleeing from the Egyptians. And then I will make your rivers dry. Which river did he dry up? The Jordan River. When led by Joshua, they uh, were coming into Israel and they crossed over um, the Jordan River was there, and it, God, again, uh, made a dry path for them to cross into the land. So he's reminding them of that and telling them, I can do anything. Look at my past faithfulness. Look at what I'm able to do. And then verse 28, here's the, uh, when Cyrus is actually named. And God, God speaking, it is I who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd. Now Cyrus, like as we said, is uh, at this point will be 150 years before he's born, and he will be the king of Persia, and uh, God is going to use him. When he says he is my shepherd, um, it, it just means that he's going to be used by God to help uh, the people of God, the Jewish nation. Cyrus was not a believer in the true God. He believed in all the gods, and he thought if he could do something to please any god, that would work out well for him. <laughs> so he had, you know, that's why he let all the exiles go, and he let all of them build their temples, and he thought, I must be in pretty good standing now because I've pleased all the gods. So he did not believe in the one true God, but he said, hey, if you believe in that God, and, you know, and I can kind of please him, you know, that'll be good for me too. So Cyrus is going to be a shepherd in that he's going to uh, allow for the people to go back to their land. And this is a, a foreshadowing of Jesus as far as um, a shepherd. You know, Jesus is the shepherd. He's the good shepherd. So just a foreshadowing in that he does good things for the people. Uh, the next line, and he will perform all my desires. Cyrus will do whatever God has called him to do, his purpose. He's going to do a lot of things. He's going to do a lot of evil things, too. But what the, the specific purpose God has for him in allowing the exiles to go back, he will do that. And he, Cyrus, declares of Jerusalem, she will be built. And of the temple, so Cyrus is saying about the temple, your foundation will be laid. So Cyrus will give the decree, we read about that, and allow that to happen. Now actually, the uh, Jerusalem will not be rebuilt until later, but it was Cyrus who allowed them to go back that they could even rebuild the temple. It's going to be rebuilt later under Artaxerxes. Um, and then again, the walls later, uh, when Nehemiah goes back, much later. Um, but so the people are saying they're hearing this and they're seeing their temple thinking, why should we be concerned about being, it being rebuilt? You know, it, it's right there. It's, it's fine. It won't happen uh, for over 100 years. So back in Isaiah 41, we were there not too long ago, last week, Cyrus was introduced, but not by name. And he was, again, a polytheist who believed in helping any god and that that would be to his advantage. And he did rebuild, help rebuild a lot of different temples to a lot of different gods. All right, uh, let's go on to uh, chapter 45, Isaiah 45. Now, it starts out saying, thus says the Lord to Cyrus, but uh, it doesn't mean Cyrus ever read this or heard this, uh, but it's more that um, it's talking to those who were uh, captives, would be captives in Babylon and to give them some encouragement. It was written to those of Judah. Uh, so when Isaiah's writing, it's to the people who would be captives in 150 years, all right? They would be captives much, much later, almost 200 years later, actually. They gotta get time for Cyrus to be born and grow up and all that. It's about 200 years later. It was written really to them. Can you imagine if you are a Jew and you were in exile in Babylon 
And, but, and you heard from, again, some of the prophets and other Jewish leaders there in Babylon, you knew that at some point, because this is, was prophesied 150 years earlier, you knew that someone named Cyrus was going to come attack Babylon and that you were going to be allowed to go back home. And you are in exile there living in Babylon. And you know that. You heard that. And then you hear of this guy named Cyrus, who, king of Persia, and he rises up and he starts taking over different areas. And you know the timeline, like Daniel did. And Daniel didn't keep that a secret, you know. Um, and we, it's very possible because Daniel did serve under Cyrus that Daniel told Cyrus uh, that, that, you know, that, that God had predicted, the one true God had predicted. Uh, maybe even showed him the scrolls of Isaiah that showed that God predicted what Cyrus would do. But just imagine living there in Babylon as a captive, as an exile, and realizing you know the prophecy and you know it's getting close. Can you imagine what that might have been like? Well, we can relate a little bit to that today because we are exiles. This is not our home. Our home is with the Lord. Our home will be either in heaven or um, if we, uh, it will be in heaven for a while and then down here on the earth and then on the new earth. Um, so there are things we are waiting for and we're seeing some signs, but for sure every day gets closer. And we can live with that same excitement of this is not our home, but we know what's going to happen. We know how it ends and it's getting closer. Give us a little taste maybe of what they went through, what they were thinking. As we go through this passage, this chapter, um, I already mentioned, but this, this phrase, there is no other. Pay attention to that. If you haven't marked it yet, you may want to underline it. There is no other is in verse 5, in verse 6, two times, in verse 14, 18, 21, two times, in verse 22, and then in the next chapter, it's used twice also. We'll see those as we go through, but you may want to make sure you mark those um, as we study it. And I'm actually going to read now to give us some background from Daniel chapter 5. Uh, Daniel chapter 5. And I'm going to uh, recap it a little bit and then read some of it. So in Daniel chapter 5, of course, Daniel was captured. He's living in Babylon. He served under a number of different kings. And at this point in Daniel 5, Daniel is an old man. And the king is Belshazzar. He's the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. He doesn't really know about Daniel. And he's having this big feast, and for this feast that Belshazzar is having, the king of Babylon, he's, he brought in all those utensils from the temple that had been stolen from the temple of God and brought to Babylon, and he brought that all out, and he's using that uh, for his feast. Um, in Daniel 5.3, it says they brought out the gold vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God, which was in Jerusalem. And the king and his nobles, his wives, and his concubines drank from them. So they're really defiling these articles that had been set aside uh, to, to worship God. And they're, they're drinking out of those. And then uh, suddenly on the wall appears a hand, j just a hand, not connected to anything. And the hand writes some words on the wall, and then it disappears. Well, that's a strange thing to have happen. And the king Belshazzar was very upset, and he called in all his wise men and magicians and all that. And they, they didn't know what those words meant. It was an unknown language, so to speak. They didn't know these, these four words were written on the wall. Um, and so then the queen mother, so it wouldn't have been Belshazzar's wife probably. It would have been um, either um, his father's wife or his grandfather's wife, one of them. I said, you know, there's this old man, Daniel, and he uh, knows a lot. He's very wise, and, um, you know, why don't you call him? He might be able to tell you what those words mean. And they, so, they go and send for Daniel. Are you the one that used to serve King Nebuchadnezzar? Are you the one that uh, might be able to read this? And if you can, we'll give you all these gifts. And Daniel says, well, you can keep your gifts, um, but um, I'll, I will tell you what it means. And, of course, he gives the glory to God. Um, for being able to do that. And I'm going to pick that story up then here in Daniel 5, 23. Um, and Daniel is talking to Belshazzar, Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, the last king of the Babylonian Empire. Verse 23, But you, Belshazzar, have exalted yourself against the Lord of heaven. Not a good thing to do. We all do it. Um, 
but not a good thing to do. You've exalted yourself against the Lord of heaven, and they have brought the vessels of his house before you, and you and your nobles, your wives, and your concubines have been drinking wine from them, these vessels from the temple. And you have praised the gods of silver and the gold of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. You're worshiping these false gods, which do not see, hear, or understand, but the God in whose hand are your life, breath, and all your ways, you have not glorified him. You're praising these other false gods, but you've not glorified the God who gave you life and breath. And then Daniel told him what the, the four words meant. And basically they mean um, talking to Belshazzar. God has numbered your kingdom and put an end to it. You have been weighed on the scales and found deficient. Your kingdom has been divided and given over to the Medes and the Persians. And then that same night, just a little while after Daniel finished talking, Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was slain that very night. Okay, so he's got this feast, and that very night, um, the, uh, Cyrus came in, and his armies came in, killed Belshazzar, and, and took over the kingdom. So that's a little history on that. So the ch chapter theme, as we said, for Isaiah 45 is God uses King Cyrus. And here's our first phrase there, thus says the Lord to Cyrus, his anointed. Now, anointed here, don't get confused. It, it doesn't mean he, um, well, let me tell you what it does mean. It means he just has a special purpose by God. He's been set apart by God to do something God wants him to do. He's prepared, he's been prepared for a special work. So talking to Cyrus, his anointed, whom I, God, whom I, God, have taken by the right hand. Uh, now again, Cyrus was not a worshiper of God. He was a polytheist. He worshiped many gods. But God can use whomever he chooses to use. And the, the, the Jewish people didn't like the fact that God used a Gentile and used a pagan king um, as part of his purposes. But, and there may be things that God does that we don't like. And we think, well, why is God using that person? Or, but God is God and he can use whomever he chooses, whether we like it or not. So he's going to use Cyrus. And here's what he's going to do. To subdue nations before him. Again, nations there, pagan, Gentile nations. Before him, before Cyrus. To loose the loins of kings. Uh, it means to kill them, destroy them. To open doors before him, that's Cyrus, so that the gates will not be shut. Now, uh, Babylon had 100 gates, and actually when the army came in, they had been left open. So here's all the people feasting and getting drunk, and the, this enemy's coming, and they, they left their gates open. Um, God says, I will go before you, Cyrus, and make the rough places smooth. I will shatter the doors of bronze and cut through their iron bars. They had a big bronze gate. That was unlocked also. Um, so we see here, this is written, again, <clears throat> at least 150 years before it's going to happen, but all these details did occur. The gates were left open. Um, what they actually did, the army did, the Euphra Euphrates River flowed under ba the city of Babylon, flowed, flowed under it, and Cyrus's army diverted the Euphrates River so those water tunnels le level went down and water, so they could just walk right through there. <clears throat> and so they came in under the wall through these water tunnels, and then, like I said, a lot of the gates, uh, they came to a big bronze gate. It was, it was unlocked, and they were able to just come right in. But this was predicted by God almost 200 years earlier. Verse 3, I will give you, Cyrus, the treasures of darkness and hidden, place of secret, hidden wealth of secret places. So all these things God's going to allow him to be successful and to conquer. Here's why. Verse 3, so that you, Cyrus, may know it is I the Lord, the God of Israel, who calls you by your name. He wanted Cyrus to know where the credit goes. Everything is always about God's glory. We talked last week about we are glory thieves, and we like to take the credit for things. And we forget sometimes that we can't take our next breath unless the Lord allows it. Everything is about God's glory. And then he said, also verse 4, here's another reason he's allowing Cyrus to conquer Babylon. For the sake of Jacob, my servant Jacob, would be the nation of Israel. Remember, Jacob was the man who had the 12 sons who became the nation of Israel. God changed Jacob's name to Israel, and that's why the nation's called Israel. But they descended from Jacob's 12 sons. So for the sake of 
Jacob, my servant, and Israel, my chosen one. So that's why God is doing all this. See, the Jews need to return to Israel because Jesus needs to be born in Israel, not in Babylon. Jesus needs to be born in Bethlehem, so the Jews have to get back there to fulfill that prophecy, and, and, and so God is using Cyrus for that. Going on talking about Cyrus, I have also called you, Cyrus, by your name. I have given you a title of honor. He's the king of Persia. Though you have not known me, I am the Lord, there is no other. There's uh, that phrase we want to watch out for and mark. Notice, there is no other. Beside me, there is no God. Very similar phrase. I will gird you, Cyrus, though you have not known me. And here's another reason why, that men may know from the rising to the setting of the sun. That's a phrase that means the whole earth. That men may know, that the whole earth may know, there is no one besides me. Mark that phrase again. I am the Lord and there is no other. God repeats this over and over. Why? Because we all have God replacements. We all have places we look and think, this will meet my need. This will make me content if I just had this. And so God reminds us over and over, there is no other. God's glory is the reason for everything, so that men may know, I am the Lord, there is no other. I am the one forming light and creating darkness, causing well-being and creating calamity. God allows calamity. We've seen this as we've seen these different nations come in and be used by God for judgment. God uses evil without being dirtied by it. <laughs> He's not affected by it. It doesn't change his holy character. I am the Lord who does all these. See, God takes full responsibility for what he does and what he allows. We sometimes tiptoe around it and we don't want God to look bad, so we're afraid to say, well, God allowed this, because then what does that make God look like? God is very open about what he does. I cause well-being and create calamity. I am the Lord who does this. So we see in these, uh, just on this, in these first verses here, we see that everything is done by the power of God. And we see that it is accomplished for his people, for my people Jacob and for Israel. And then we see it's also accomplished that all might know that God is the only God. He is God alone. We see all of that in these opening verses here. All right, let's go on to verse 8. This is a little interlude here. He's talking about the millennial kingdom. Drip down, O heavens, from above, and let the clouds pour down Righteousness. Now, clouds usually pour down rain or snow, but here they're pouring down righteousness. Uh, it's talking about during the, uh, it's figurative, figurative language about during the millennial kingdom that the, the earth will be flooded with the righteousness of God. Let the earth open up and salvation bear fruit and righteousness spring up with it. I, the Lord, have created it. So that's our future too. We will be there in the millennial kingdom. Now, verse 9 starts a, a the, um, couple things. It addresses the objections that people had to using Cyrus, but it also makes the point that we were not made to question God or to sit in judgment of him or try to tell him what to do or, or question his ways. Verse 9, woe, impending disaster to the one who quarrels with his maker. God reminds us, I made you. I'm the creator. I made everything. We are not to argue with God regarding his plans and who he uses or his timeline. But we do. Uh, we, we may not argue out loud, but in our hearts and in our thoughts. We're, why would you do this? And I have a better plan, God. And what are you doing? And where are you going with that? And I don't see any good coming of that. And why would you do this, God? Woe to the one who quarrels with his maker. An earthenware vessel among the vessels of earth. We're just, we're just pots among other pots. And we are not the potter. We're just pots. Will the clay say to the potter, what are you doing? No, the clay doesn't say to the potter, what are you doing? The, the clay just allows the potter to mold and do whatever he wants. Or the thing you are making say, he has no hands. Again, that's, just, that's the pot arguing about what's being done to it. Woe to him that says to a father, what are you begetting? Or to a woman, to what are you giving birth? So again, this idea here is that we, we it would be foolish, it's, it's ludicrous, it's silly to argue with the potter or for a newborn to question his parents. 
uh, as an analogy. Okay, verse 11, here's our phrase, thus says the Lord, the Holy One of Israel and his maker, meaning Israel's maker. God is constantly reminding his people who he is and what his relationship is to them. Ask me, God's talking, ask me about the things to come concerning my sons, that would be Israel. And you shall commit to me the work of my hands. You shall commit to me the work of my hands, meaning leave it to me. I am God. I will do what I will do. Leave it to me. It is I who made the earth, created man upon it. I stretched out the heavens with my hands, and I ordained all their hosts. That's talking about the stars. Okay, so God um, made the heavens and... Um, also all the stars and, and where they would be and we learned about he, he keeps them there and he named them. So what he's saying here is the coming of Cyrus is as certain as the existence of the universe that God created. I created this, I put the stars there and just as certain as I did that I'm going to raise up Cyrus to do what I've called him to do. Going on with that verse 13, God is saying, I will use Cyrus. I have aroused him in righteousness, meaning God's plan is righteous. It doesn't mean Cyrus is. It means God's plan is. I will make all his ways smooth, meaning I'll make it easy for him. I'll put all the details and circumstances in place that he can go in and do this. He will build my city and will let my exiles go free, as we know from Babylon back to Israel. Without any payment or reward, says the Lord of hosts. So Cyrus did not receive any financial gain from allowing the Jews to go back. Now we start another section here with verse 14. And again, this is in the future. And there's our strong phrase, thus says the Lord. The products of Egypt, merchandise of Cush, and the Sabaeans, men of stature, will come over to you, Israel, and be yours, Israel. They will walk behind you, Israel. They will come over in chains and will bow down to you. They will make supplication to you, Israel. Surely God is with you, Israel, and there is none else, no other God. Again, there's that other phrase we're looking for, talking about the millennial kingdom, when Israel will reign and the other nations will be under the rule um, of Israel. Um, Israel will have a special place as far as ruling and reigning with the Lord. All right, verse 15. Truly you are a God who hides himself, O God of Israel, Savior. So this would be Isaiah speaking here. And what it means is God, it doesn't mean God hides himself and he doesn't want anyone to know him. We know the Bible says those that God says, seek me and you will find me. But it means he hides the details, he hides timing. Even the prophets didn't know a lot of, of what they uh, received from God. Uh, God didn't reveal everything. Uh, for instance, God uh, hid to a great degree the fact that all the Gentiles would be saved. And he hid until Isaiah's time about the choice of, of Cyrus and the return of the exiles. He certainly hid a lot about the incarnation, about the cross. There's, there's clues and hints of it, which on our side we can look back and say, oh yeah, we know what this is. But in their day, they didn't have a lot of information. He hid the church age from them. Uh, the prophets, Old Testament prophets, didn't see this time gap that we're in right now for 2,000 years called the church age. So he hides details and timing and, and some of his ways. Um, again, um, God's ways are incomprehensible. No one could even guess what he would do. And that's a good reminder for us. We cannot guess all that God's going to do. And we look at a situation and we can get all upset. We don't know what God's going to do with it. That's why trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. You don't know what God's plan is and what he will do. Verse 16, talking about idols again, they will be put to shame and even humiliated, all of them, who? The manufacturers of idols. They will go away together in humiliation. Verse 17, Israel has been saved by the Lord with an everlasting salvation. You, talking to Israel, Israel, you will not be put to shame or humiliated to all eternity. So God has an amazing plan for Israel. It's better than they could even think. And God has not abandoned Israel. He has not forgotten Israel. He has not replaced Israel. Verse 18, for thus says the Lord, hope that phrase sounds familiar, hope you notice that. And he's going to talk again about creation, that he's the creator. He, 
He, he reminds us of that over and over. He created the heavens. He's the God who formed the earth and made it. He established it. He did not create it a waste place, but formed it to be inhabited. I think that's a point there against evolution. God did not create the earth to be a waste place, and then things evolved. He formed it to be inhabited right from the very beginning. I am the Lord. There is none else. Once again, that phrase. I have not spoken in secret in some dark land. I did not say to the offspring of Jacob, seek me in a waste place. I, the Lord, speak righteousness, declaring things that are upright. So it says, uh, Isaiah said, truly, God, you are God who hides himself. Um, I explained what that meant. But here, God did reveal through his prophets, and he was very open and accessible to the people uh, regarding a lot of things. He said, I have not spoken in secret, and I declare things to you. There's things that God, that were hidden to them for a while that are revealed in the New Testament. There are things that are still hidden from us, but whatever God wants us to know is in the word of God. Let's start with that and get to know that. Now God's going to speak um, to the idols. So starting in verse 20, gather yourselves and come, draw near together, you fugitives of the nations. Again, whenever we have plural nations, that's all the pagan Gentile nations, and this would be talking about the humans still alive at the end of the tribulation. Gather yourself together, those that survived the tribulation. And um, he's talking about people who um, have idols. He says, they have no knowledge who carry about their wooden idol and pray to a God who cannot save. Declare and set forth your case. Indeed, let, let them consult together. Okay, let's talk about this. I want to prove my point here, God says. Who has announced this from of old? Who has long since declared it? Who prophesied this? Who predicted this? And this could be in relation to just all the different uh, prophecies, but in, uh, uh, an immediate one would have been about Cyrus. Is it not I, the Lord, and there is no other God besides me? A righteous God and a savior. There is none except me, and again, uh, we all at times have God replacements and our world, the unbelieving world, certainly does. But only, only God can predict the future. Verse 22, I love this. Look at verse 22. Turn to me and be saved all the ends of the earth. So here's an invitation for everyone, not just the Jews, but everyone to turn to the Lord and be saved. For I am God and there is no other. The whole point of creation, why did God create people, is for God to glorify himself by saving people. If you ever wonder, why did God do that? Why did God do that? Why did God do this? Everything is about God's glory. We may not see the connection or the correlation or how it glorifies God, but everything God does is for his glory, including the whole point of creation. Verse 23, God is speaking, I have sworn by myself, the word has gone forth from my mouth in righteousness, and will not turn back, here it is, here's what God is saying, that to me every knee will bow, every tongue will swear allegiance. Notice the individuals here, every one, every person individually. And they will say of me, only in the Lord are righteousness and strength. And uh, jot down Philippians 2, 5 through 11, that's that very familiar passage in the New Testament. It says every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. So here it's prophesied that that will happen. And then again in the New Testament. And that has not happened yet. That will be at the end of the tribulation. Men will come to him. He's talking about Jesus there. Uh, all who were angry at him will be put to shame. Not everyone will put their faith in Christ, but they will all have to bow to him. And those that are still angry at him will face judgment. Um, there will be many that will, again, will harden their hearts and, and still will not put their faith in Christ. But they will have to admit he is Lord. They will bow down to him. They will have to. But they'll not all be saved. They will just acknowledge the Lord as God alone. In the Lord, all the offspring of Israel will be justified and will glory. So what this is talking about is all of the remnant who put their faith in Christ will be justified. They will be declared perfect as we are, declared perfect. Only perfect people go to heaven. We get declared perfect when we put our faith in Christ and are covered in his perfection. You might want to jot down Romans 11, 25 through 27, quotes this and talks about that fact. 
So this is, it's not automatic if you're a Jew, you're going to be saved. Everybody gets saved the same way by putting their faith individually in Christ, but all the remnant that puts their faith in Christ uh, will be saved. I want to read an excerpt from C.S. Lewis's book, uh, uh, Lying the Witch in the Wardrobe. This goes along with this phrase we were looking at over and over that says, there is no other. So this is a scene where uh, the Christ figure is a lion and a girl named Jill bursts into an opening in the forest and she's very thirsty. And she sees a stream not very far away. Well, she doesn't rush forward to the stream to get a drink because right in front of that um, is a lion resting in the sun. They're blocking her way to the stream. And the lion says to Jill, are you not thirsty? I'm dying of thirst, said Jill. Well, then drink, says the lion. Oh, well, may I, could I, um, would you mind just going away while I get a drink, said Jill. The lion answered this only by a look and a very low growl. And as Jill gazed at its motionless bulk, she realized that she might as well have asked the whole mountain to move aside for her convenience. The delicious rippling noise of the stream was driving her nearly frantic. Well, well, will you promise not to, not to do anything to me if I come, asked Jill. I make no promise, said the lion. Jill was so thirsty now that without noticing it, she had actually come a step nearer. Do you eat girls, she said. I have swallowed up girls and boys, women and men, kings and emperors, cities and entire realms, said the lion. It didn't say this as if it were boasting, nor as if it were sorry about it, but just said it. I dare not come and drink, said Jill. Well, then you will die of thirst, said the lion. Oh dear, said Jill, coming another step near. I, I suppose I must go and look for another stream then. There is no other stream, said the lion. There is no other God. Our only hope, help, everything is based on coming to Christ. There is no other. I think that's a great analogy, great example there from that book. If you haven't read that Chronicles of Narnia series, series I highly recommend it. Okay, let's um, go through Isaiah 46. And... I actually want to start by um, reading Psalm 137. Psalm 137 is so interesting. When the exiles got back from Babylon, they wrote Psalm 137, remembering their experiences there in Babylon. So listen as I read this from Psalm 137. This is the exiles in Babylon. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. Upon the willows in the midst of it, so on the trees, we hung our harps. For there our captors demanded of us songs and our tormentors mirth, saying, sing one of the songs of Zion. Well, how can we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? So these captives, they're remembering how they sat and wept and they hung their harps in the trees because their captors were saying, be happy, laugh, sing us one of those songs of Zion. And Zion was so great. And they wept and they grieved over their land. Well, Nancy DeMoss Wagamuth has written, ancient Babylon was an advanced civilization of stunning beauty, wealth, and prosperity, but it was not home to God's children. They were captives, tormented by those who despised Jerusalem. Babylon, for the Jews, may have been lovely, but it was a foreign land. The world we are living in is the city of man. It's not where God's children belong. We are captives in a sense. We're scorned by those who despise the heavenly Jerusalem. If you're a Christian, you cannot feel at home in this world because your citizenship is not here. We cannot expect Babylon to be home or to feel like home. So we shouldn't be surprised when the worldview of Babylon is different from that of Zion. In the process of living in Babylon, it's important we don't forget our true home. And that means we are not supposed to assimilate in this world. So don't get too comfortable in Babylon. You have a passport to a different country. 
one where you will live forever with the Lord. And we could go there today if the Lord returns, but this is not our home. So Babylon represents the world culture outside of Christ. So I'm going to go through this um, quickly here. What have I got, 30 seconds? Something like that. Okay. So this is Babylon's idols uh, versus the true God. And it starts out mentioning a couple of Babylon's idols. We've got Bel and Nebo. Bel has bowed down. Nebo stoops over. So this is a sign of humiliation. Uh, they're not standing upright and being worshipped. They're bowed down. And these are Babylonian gods. And the different kings would then take on names that reflected the gods. So Belshazzar um, took, took that name. And also Nebuchadnezzar from Nebo. And there were a number of other kings that did the same thing. They were named after the Babylonian gods. So this is talking about when Cyrus comes in and he conquers Babylon, the Babylonian gods are humiliated. Their images are consigned to the beasts and the cattle. So it's talking about the Babylonians uh, fled when Cyrus came in. They fled and they took their idols with them. They packed them on donkeys, the beasts and the cattle. They packed their idols uh, on them. And then it says, the things that you carry are burdensome. Talking about to the donkeys. <coughs> donkeys, you, you're carrying these heavy idols. I, I brought a couple of, um, of weights in here just to give an illustration. I don't have any you know, idols at my home to bring in, so, but, but these are heavy. <laughs> and so this is going to illustrate Bell and, and Nebo, these idols. And they would load these, and they may have been quite huge. They would load them on the donkeys as they were fleeing and take them away. And these idols, they're, they're heavy, and it says, the things you carry are burdensome, a load for the weary beast. So these animals are lugging these idols around. Now, if these things had to be carried around by animals, how can they help anyone, you know? Uh, they're a load, they're burdensome. They stooped over, they have bowed down together, they could not rescue the burden. So the burden that the people had could, could not be rescued by these idols because they themselves are a burden. And they themselves have gone into captivity. The idols themselves are being captured now by Cyrus and the Medo-Persians. How could they help anyone? So here's the thing. So the people are fleeing, but they're taking their idols with them. Sometimes we have the idea that if I just had a different set of circumstances, I'd be happier. Things would be better if I could just flee the situation I'm in and have a, a totally different set of circumstances, then I'd be happy and fulfilled and content. Two things, the problem with that is when you go somewhere, you take you with you. <laughs> you still have you with you, and you still take your God replacements. So if our idea is if I can just have a whole different life, a whole different set of circumstances, I'll be that you taking you with you and taking your God replacements, your idols with you. And we, we all believe that lie sometimes. The, the, the way to come to the truth in that is to, again, focus on the truth that God is in control and where he has put us or allowed us to be, we are to glorify him there until he in, uh, shows us clearly otherwise always within the confines of his word and will. All right, so these idols have gone into captivity. And then God gives a great contrast here, starting with verse 3. We've got these idols that are being carried by these beasts, carried by these donkeys, and, and, and borne by those. But look at verse 3. Listen to me, O house of Jacob, and all the remnant of the house of Israel, you who have been borne by me and have been carried from the womb. So the contrast here, God is carrying his people. These other idols, they have to be carried. God carries his people. Even to your old age, I will be the same. Even to your graying years, I will bear you. You don't have to carry me around. You know, if it gets to the point where you have to carry your idols around, it's time for a new God, right? It's time for the true God. I have done it. I will carry you. I will bear you. I will deliver you. What a contrast between the idols that had to be carried around and God who carries his people. Then we have a whole other section there, verses 5 through 7. This is the fourth time that uh, making idols has been described. We had it in chapter 40 and chapter 41 and chapter 44, and now we have it here again. The foolishness of making an idol yourself and then bowing down to it. 
It's absurd, absurd to worship something that has been made by man, must be carried around, cannot move, and cannot answer or deliver. Look at the last line in verse 7 there. <clears throat> of two last lines. Though one may cry to it, it can't answer. It cannot deliver him from his distress. We've talked many times about the fact that we have God replacements. We look otherwhere other than to the Lord. We keep hoping. We keep thinking. This other thing, it will meet my needs. It will help me if I just had this. But God will allow our idols to disappoint us and betray us and fail us uh, because he wants us to turn to him and find true hope and help. Okay, verse 8 is where um, we're reminded to remember and uh, remember this and be assured. This is talking about the idols versus God, the contrast between idols and God. Recall it to mind, you transgressors. He's talking to the people of God. You transgressors, your idol worships, you're, you are idol worshipers. Bring to mind, remember the former things long past, all the things throughout your history. Remember all that, verse 9, for I am your God. Remember all I've done for you. Remember what I've said about idols. Um, I am your God. There is no other. I am God. There's no one like me. I declare the end from the beginning. So God's record of bearing and carrying them, of, t of, of, of delivering them. <clears throat> from ancient times, I've declared things which have not been done. Again, he foretells the future because he determines what it will be. He says, my purpose will be accomplished and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. That brings me a lot of hope and comfort and encouragement that God says his purposes will prevail. That whatever he decides, that will happen. <clears throat> Nothing stops him. And then in verse 11, he's referring to Cyrus here. Um, calling a bird of prey from the east, that's Cyrus. A bird of prey meaning a fierce, someone fierce. The man of my purpose, that's Cyrus, from a far country, Persia. Truly I have spoken, truly I will bring it to pass. I have planned it, surely I will do it. Again, this is the God that we have. He makes plans, he determines things, and it happens. So he's saying the exiles will return. But when they return, they will not be, still not be free. They will be ruled you know, by, by governors and people of the, the Medo-Persian Empire. But they needed to trust God that all the other prophecies about their <clears throat> um, future will come to pass. And same for us. You know, we have to trust God, and things don't seem to be what we would like them to be. We know how the story ends, and we live by faith and trust that. God always has a plan. It may not be what we understand or like, but nothing will thwart his plan. And let's finish up here. Listen to me, you stubborn-minded, who are far from righteousness. I will bring near my righteousness. It is not far off. So don't miss that. They're far off. God is the one who brings people near. God is the one who brings salvation. God is the one who provides a way of salvation and opens people's understanding and hearts. My salvation will not delay. I will grant salvation in Zion. Talking about the cross there, but also about the fact that the Jews will eventually come to Christ. I will grant salvation in Zion and my glory for Israel. Again, God is not finished with Israel. Well, we are finished with our lesson. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to praise you today. We want to praise you that there is no one like you, and you are in control of history and the present and the future. Help us to live, Lord, what we say we believe, which is that you are in control. We thank you that salvation has been extended to all, to the Gentiles, not just the Jews. Lord, we praise you that your purposes are righteous and just and loving, and nothing thwarts your purposes. And each day, Lord, draws closer to the end of human history. So help us to represent Christ well and to share the gospel often. We love and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.